be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Our lesson from Matthew follows the lesson from Matthew we heard last week. This is all part of Matthew's account of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Jesus having given new meaning to what it means to be called blessed, then goes on to give two other metaphors for how those who call him Lord are to relate to the rest of creation. Jesus says that his followers are the salt of the earth, and the light of the world. Now unlike pure salt, the sodium chloride that we use today, the salt of the Dead Sea could in fact lose its saltiness. It's full of other minerals that compromise its ability to live up to its salty potential. And so when it was useless, as it became after a while, it was good for nothing more than giving traction to some slippery, wet roads. Yes, a use for salt even in the ancient world. But salt at its best is not only or not only served as the principal preservation agent for food, but also as fuel for cooking it. In many ancient Near East uh, ovens, salt was added to the dung that was used as the fuel in an oven. And those salted fuel uh, lumps were then placed on top of a brick of salt in the oven. And the salt in the fuel and the salt on the brick worked together as catalysts to speed up the combustion of that fuel and to raise the temperature in the oven. And when that salt block in the oven had lost its ability to speed up the burning, to uh, lost its ability to increase the heat of that oven, it was no longer any good. It had lost its saltiness, and it too was thrown out. Jesus says that we are the salt of the earth. And he's thinking about this salt from the Red Sea and how Dead Sea and how it was used in their world. Christians then, who are the salt of the earth, have a vital role to play with their saltiness in the here and now, helping to establish the kingdom. We are called to serve as agents of change, as catalysts to help speed up the establishment of God's kingdom and God's desires for all of creation. This was, of course, and is today still the work of the martyrs. They gave themselves up completely, even to the last for the glory of God. And their deaths served as sparks for a movement that spread around the world. But this too is also the work of Christian activists. It is this passion for speeding up what they perceive to be God's will for the world that drives the hearts of those who speak out against injustice. From those who march in the streets to those who hold protest signs, the desire to see God's justice, no one else's, God's justice drives these activists to sacrifice much for the cause. Jesus also says that his followers 
are the light of the world. And he says that to light a lamp and then cover it up is just ludicrous. Why light the lamp if it won't be used to light the room or the way forward? The same is true with the life of Christians. Why claim Jesus as the light to enlighten the cosmos if we want to then hide that light away so as to be as discreet as possible about our beliefs and not to let the light then do what it was intended to do, to shine. We aren't the source of that light, but we must choose to either hide it away for ourselves or to let it shine through us, to refract through our lives into the darkest corners of the lives of others. This light shining is, of course, the work of those greatest minds and thinkers, those greatest preachers and teachers of the Christian faith, shining forth in the darkness of their own times and places. They have made Christ and God's kingdom known. But what about those of us who perhaps aren't exactly activists in the traditional sense? Are we then failing to be catalysts, the kind of catalysts that Jesus tells us that we are? And what of those of us who aren't eloquent speakers or courageous leaders? Are we necessarily then hiding the light of Christ that is in us? While in seminary, I was sitting at lunch one day with a friend and two professors, and the friend and I were discussing whether or not we were going to go join in on some protest on the National Mall, the cause for which I cannot now remember, and the two professors weighed in on our conversation. One had marched in the civil rights movement in the 1960s, the other had not. One had held many a protest sign, the other had not. Yet the one who had not marched and had not held signs didn't shy away from that fact as if it were something of which to be ashamed. Indeed, he said he had always been driven to a different kind of activism. His was an activism of intense prayer, of study, and of writing. And this was no cop-out, no easy way out. He was very serious about this work. His contributions to the causes of God's justice were surely quieter than his colleagues, but nonetheless just as important. And he cautioned us to choose wisely between those things for which we would be used up righteously in action out in the world and those things for which we would be used up righteously in prayer for God's justice. He never says, choose not to be used up, but how you will be used up. And he wasn't discounting those who marched in the streets. Instead, he was affirming the importance of those who work just as hard in their prayers for those who are out doing the marching. They go together, are not opposites. One is not easier than the other. They are both valid and essential callings. A well-known preacher, Barbara Brown Taylor, wrote describing a visit of hers to a monastery for a retreat, and she describes a little suspiciously the loveliness of the setting, the gardens and the architecture, the antiques everywhere. She describes their prayer routine, a bell calling them to stop what they are doing and to don their white habits, their robes, and enter into the chapel for prayer. And it all seemed just a little too idyllic for her to be an authentic Christian witness. That is until she watched them pray. And she writes, Prayer was their job, and they took it seriously. They prayed like men who were shoveling coal into the basement furnace of some great edifice. They did not seem to care whether anyone upstairs knew who they were or what they were doing. 
Their job was to keep the fire going so that people stayed warm and they poured all their energy into doing just that. The monks saw their prayer as a catalyst propelling, propelling forward God's cause and those who were out working to establish it. And so on this day when we hear about our saltiness and brightness from God, it, it is only appropriate that we stop for a moment or two and reflect on how well we are doing living into that. How salty are we? How are we letting God's light shine through us? Are we out stomping down injustice under our feet? Are we praying like fire that God's will and no one else's, God's will be done on this earth as it is in heaven? We don't have the choice of not living into our saltiness, of not being the light. And to choose otherwise is to choose something other than what Jesus calls us to be and do. It's a matter of vital importance for us because salt that has lost its saltiness isn't fit for much at all except to be traction on a road. And a light hidden from view is just counterproductive. So I urge you, be alive to God's call on you. Season this world in which you live by your action and your prayer. And help brighten up the gloom of injustice by your witness to Christ's redeeming work. Salty and bright in all things be salty and bright that God's kingdom may be made real on earth as in heaven.